Hello and welcome to a new video. This is for my Algebra 1 series. It is about factoring polynomials again. This is actually part two of factoring polynomials. And so it's, you know, it's going to build off of part one. So um, factoring, remember, has to do with breaking something up into two things that multiply together to get it. Um, so for numbers, that could mean, you know, factoring 24. We could just be saying what numbers divide into 24, or we could be saying, um, you know, give me pairs of numbers that multiply to get 24. When we're factoring polynomials, we're saying, like, what are two things that multiply together to get this? So let's check out a warm up to kind of get back in the groove. So these say factor. This is where knowing the names of these maybe is helpful because. These are quadratic trinomials, and we do the same sort of thing every time we have a quadratic trinomial. We try to split it up into two parentheses. We first check to see if they have a greatest common factor, um, which they do not, but then we go through and say, okay, this is basically like the opposite of foiling. We take the x squared, the first term, and we split it up into these two spots. And the only way to really split up, split up x squared, there's two ways to split it up. You could split it up into one times x squared, or you could split it up into x times x. And the reason we do x times x is because that's what's gonna help us get the two x that's in the middle. So x squared splits up into x and x. And then we look at the last term, the third term, and we say, okay, that needs to go here and here. So we need two things that multiply together to get a positive one. And so then you may be thinking, well, what does this, what does the middle term do? Because if we fill in these two spots, we don't have anything left to do. We should have our answer. So most of the time, there's more than one option for what multiplies to get that third term. And so we want to pick the things that multiply the multiply together to get it. That if we did the outer and inner terms here, if we do outer and inner and add them together, they give us 2x. So we want to pick what are numbers that multiply together to get 1 that add to get 2. And there's actually not very many options here, right? The only things to multiply together to get a positive 1 is 1 times 1 and negative 1 times negative 1. We want 1 times 1 because those add to get 2. So I'm going to put a plus 1 and a plus 1. And so what we're saying is that the thing that multiplies together to get x squared plus 2x plus 1 is x plus 1 times x plus 1. You actually can also rewrite that, by the way, as a single parenthesis with a squared to say, I have x plus 1, but I have it twice. So that's how that works. Now, they can be trickier than that because most of the time there's more options that we have to kind of go through. So for part b here, x squared plus 3x minus 4, we're still gonna split x squared up into x and x, but let's take a look at this negative four. We wanna say what multiplies to get negative four, and we're gonna split that up here and here, but we wanna pick what multiplies to get negative four that will add to get us a three from the middle term. So negative four, we could do one times four or two times two, but one of the numbers has to be negative since we're supposed to multiply to get negative four. So if we think about our options here. One and four makes more sense. So we want to think, okay, if it's one times four and one of them needs to be negative, is it that I want to do four minus one or do I want to do one minus four? Which one of those gives me a positive three? And the answer is four minus one gives us a positive three. So that means our four needs to be plus and our one needs to be minus. And as we're doing these factoring problems, what is great about them is that we can multiply our answers and see if they give us what we started with and, and really easily check our answers. I think most of us um, do a pretty good job with multiplying polynomials, either with distributing or um, FOIL or whatever. And so it's nice that it's so easy to check these or relatively easy to check these. So this is one of the things we did in the last lesson. Now we're gonna build because if you didn't already realize, we only actually factored quadratic trinomials that had a leading coefficient of one. So remember, the if it's in standard form, which means the biggest exponent is first, the leading coefficient is the very first number you see. 
And in fact, ours didn't have numbers. These were x squared and x squared. So there's an un, unstated number here, right? That says, oh, um, this is actually a one in front. The leading coefficient of these are one. So what happens whenever we make the leading coefficient something other than one? It actually makes our problem a lot more complicated. Not impossible to do, it just, it like really makes this a more challenging thing. And so because of this, there's a bunch of different ways that we can do this. And they kind of all amount to the same thing. There are quite a few different ways that we can do this. Um, what we've actually been doing when our coefficient was one, we could call um, guess and check as a method. So guess and check is the idea that we're gonna guess to see if we can come up with the right answer without using any other like tricks um, to do it. So here's how this would work on a problem like what I have here, 2x squared plus 5x plus 3. Quadratic trinomials, if they factor, most likely factor into two parentheses. Remember how I talked about we want to split this up? We're still going to put x and x here. But now x times x gives us x squared. Where do we put the 2 is kind of our question. Do I put it here or do I put it here or does it matter? And actually, it doesn't really matter which place we put the two. We need one of these to have a two and the other one to just have a one because two x times x gives us two x squared. There's, I mean, we could like switch the places they are in the parentheses, but we're still basically doing the same thing. Then we want to split the three up into two things that multiply together to get three and we want to put them here and here. Now you may be thinking, why is this hard? Three only has one option, right? One times three, or I guess negative one times negative three. But since these are all positive, we probably don't want the negative version. Well, here's the thing. Putting a one and three in these spots, it matters which one you put where this time. Because what we want is to be able to get this five X when we do our outer and inner terms added together. So it basically ends up being that there are two situations we're going to guess and check to see which one's right. Based on just what we've been doing, we split the two x squared up into two x and x, we split the three up into one and three, but is it supposed to be this first way or the second way? So real quick, we do a, a guess and check, or this, this is our check part. We do two x times three, and get 6x, we do 1 times x and get 1x. What do those add together to be? They give us 7x, that's not what we wanted. So then we do it with uh, this other way. 2x times 1 is 2x, 3 times x is 3x, 3x plus 2x is 5x. So this is the way we want it. We want it to be 2x plus 3 and x plus 1. The only way to really know, if you're gonna use guess and check, the only way to know which one to put where is to actually like think about the outer and inner terms and see if uh, multiplying those and adding them gives you the correct fit. So um, we're gonna do this some more on a couple more problems just to try to get the hang of it. So a little story for you, a little background information. I do not remember being taught how to do this with anything other than guess and check. And I don't know if that's just because guess and check was working for me so I didn't pay attention to anything else. Um, or if my teacher just really thought guess and check was the best way. Since becoming a teacher and having to teach this myself, I've learned of three ways to do this that is different than guess and check. And so that's what I'm gonna show you after example one, because honestly, unless I can pretty quickly come up with the answer on guess and check, I would rather not do guess and check. I would rather use a method that takes some uh, more writing, but takes less thinking, <laughs> if that makes sense. So let's do a here. We're gonna split up two x squared, just like in the last one to two x and x. And then we're gonna say, how do I split up five? Well, there's really only one option again, one and five. So we want uh, to do this so that when I do these two together and these two together, they add to give me seven x. So is that going to be if I do one and five? So let's see, that's an one X and 10 X. Well, no, one X and 10 X is 11 X. So that's not right. So I guessed one and five, uh, the one five, the one first and the five second, and I was wrong. 
So now let me switch them around. So let's put the five here and the one here. So five times x is five x, two x times one is two x, those add to give me seven x. So this is the right way, which is good because I was thinking there were only two options. So um, <laughs> that was the second option I tried. Um, and I'm writing down this part where I check for five x and two x and add to get seven x. Um, but at some point you could uh, probably just do that check in your head. Um, I guess and check tends to, I think, be the favorite of people who don't like showing work, who like doing things in their head instead of writing them down. Um, so if that's you, then you should, you should uh, definitely give this method a try. So B, 3x squared plus 8x plus 4. Well, 3x squared, um, since we're splitting it up into x and x, there's really only one option here. We can put 3x and x, or we could put x first and 3x second. I don't know why, but I always put the number... If there's only one number between them, then I always put it for, with the first one. Um, so there is a level of complexity here that we aren't addressing that. What if this was 4x squared? Uh, then we'd actually have a lot more things to try, right? Because 4x squared could split up into 1x and 4x or 2x and 2x. So keep that in mind. Now let's split up this 4. Um, our options are 1 and 4 or 2 and 2. And what we want is to be able to do this and this together and we want them to add to get 8x. So there are basically four things that we can guess. No, three because of it being two and two, which are the same number. We could put one and then four or, the, or we could put four and then one or we could put two and two. And so this is where like the reason this is best for people who like doing math in your head because then you don't have to write down an erase, write down an erase. So if I if I think I'm going to put one and four, then I have to that I in my head, I'm actually like or actually that's not in my head. I, I would probably like point to them on my paper and go, OK, if I put the four here and three. That's twelve. X and one is one. So twelve plus one is thirteen. That's not right. Um, how about if I do it the other way around? How about if I do it the other way around? So I just did one in the first and four in the second. So now if I do um, four in the first and one in the second, that's three X and four X, which is seven X. That's not gonna work. So if I do two and two, um, which honestly, if I wasn't, if I was doing this myself, I would have tried two and two first probably. Um, so if I put two and two, that's gonna give me um, 6x here and it's going to give me 2x here and so together that makes 8x so it is 3x plus 2 and x plus 2 okay um so that is guess and check the bigger your numbers for your first and last terms are like the more factors they have the harder it is to guess and check because the more uh, possibilities there are so if we end up with something that's like got a lot of factors in either of those or both of those places, we'd probably want to have a backup method. So what are these methods? Um, I actually don't know what the name of this first one is. I call it the box method because you make a box. You actually make four boxes. Um, so that's a method. Two is slide and divide. Three is called split the middle term. And um, I didn't name either of those. So they, they're actual names of things. Each of these has some pros and cons to it. Each of them actually uses uh, a lot of the same math. It's just the way you write it that makes it different. So I'm gonna show you each of these ways um, and I have them listed in order of my preference. So if I do the box method or if you watch me do the box method and you like it, you could stop and just use the box method. But if you watch the box method and you're like, I'm not really feeling that, um, then watch me do slide and divide. And if you like that, then stop. If you don't, then watch split the middle term. Um, and it may be that you need to break this up because this is a lot of information to go through all at the same time. Um, but any of these three will work. I think um, personally that the box method tends to be the easiest one for students to do. Um, my preference to use on my own, if I'm just doing factoring myself, for whatever reason, um, is to do slide and divide. Uh, so let's give example two here a try. I'm gonna use the box method. So the box method starts off by you making a box 
and then making that box have four smaller boxes. You want the boxes to be big enough to fit things like two in or whatever your letter is. Uh, it also, if you've had biology um, or done this in a science class, it should basically look like a Punnett square. And you're gonna see something, or you're, you're gonna actually be like, wow, this seems a lot like a Punnett square. Okay, so we want to um, put these things, these three terms into our square. We might be thinking there's three terms. How are we gonna put three terms into four squares? So we're gonna put 12 in squared in the top left. We're gonna put four in the bottom right. And then the way we come up with what's in these other two is we ask ourselves a quick question here. We, do, we actually do 12 times four, which is 48. And we say, what multiplies get 48 that adds yet 19? And that's what's gonna go in these two boxes with an N because these other two boxes are what we add together to get 19 in. So let's see, multiplies together to get 48, adds yet 19. I have no idea, one and 48, two and 24, three and 16, three and 16 adds yet 19. It doesn't matter which place we put the three in, which place we put the 16, um, so just, pick one and the other and now we've got our box set up so we're going to use our box here to figure out what should go in our two parentheses and so the way we do this is we look at um like we're going to look at these two and say what do these have in common and this is where it's going to feel like a punnett square we're going to say <laughs> whoops we're going to say okay I can divide 12 in squared and 16 in by four in, and I'm gonna write it right here. So it's like a reverse Punnett square where instead of what's on the outside, we're, cut, we're put, using to put on the inside, we're taking what's on the inside and using it to write what's on the outside. So that's four in. And then I'm gonna look at the bottom two. This is going well. So three in and four, what do those have in common? Well, they don't actually have anything in common. So I'm gonna put a one right here. And then I'm gonna look at the left side here, 12 in squared and three in and say, what do those have in common that I can divide by? They're both divisible by three, they both have an in. And then I'm gonna do 16 in and four and say, what do these both have in common? They both have a four. So, what we have done basically is come up with what multiplies to get each of these boxes. So if I look at like the three in and the four in, those together make 12 in squared. Four and four in make 16 in. Three in and one make three in. Four and one make four. And so now we can just write this as our two parentheses. We put a plus here and a plus here. Our parentheses are three in plus four and four in plus one. And that's our answer. If you liked guess and check, by the way, try to guess and check on this one. And um, I would imagine pretty quickly, you either get the answer or get frustrated um, because 12 in squared, that's a, there's a lot of things it can split up into. Four has a few things, not a ton of things, but a few things. And so very quickly you might be like, okay, this is frustrating. Um, so the answer here is three in plus four times four in plus one. So I want you to take a moment and be like, okay, does it seem like it works for me? Like I said, this is um, the one that I think works best for most students. Uh, so because of, partially because of this relationship to a Punnett square that we've got going on. So I also really like uh, drawing a box and then we put that box inside of another box and then we mail it to ourselves and when it arrives, we smash it with a hammer. Okay, that's a Emperor's New Groove reference, by the way. Uh, 10x squared is going to go in the top left. Negative 5 is going to go in the bottom right. The other two places are going to have x's. We're looking for um, we're, we're looking for how do we make this work so that we can pick two numbers that add to get 23 so that it'll be 23x. And the way we figure that out is we do 10 and negative 5 together, which is negative 50, and we say what multiplies to get negative 50 that adds to get 23? So that's going to be uh, 25 and 2. Since it multiplies, to get a negative. One of those can be negative. Our question is, do we want 25 minus 2 or do we want 2 minus 25 to get a positive? We want 25 and minus 2. So here and here. 
Now we're going to look at the top two and say, what do these have in common? That would be a 5x. We're going to look at the bottom two. They don't have a number in common. They don't have an x in common, but they're both negative. So we're going to put negative 1 here. We're going to look at the two on the left, 10x squared and negative 2x, and say, what do these have in common? That would be uh, 2x. And then we're going to look at these two, 25x and minus 5. They both have a 5 in common. They don't have a negative in common because only one of them is negative. Now, a check you want to do here is to say, do all of my signs work? Like 5x and 2x is a positive 10x squared. 2x times negative 1 gives me negative 2x. 5 times negative 1 gives me negative 5. 5 times 5x gives me 25x. Looks like everything is right, so I just need to do my parentheses here for my answer. So let me say this again. If you feel like this is a good method for you, you should stop watching the video and just start doing the thing. But either now or later, if you're like, man, this box method just really isn't working for me, then there are two other ways that you can, you can learn to do it. Um, if you feel like you're the type of person who could look at all three ways and then decide, that's great. Um, but if you're the type of person who would just feel overwhelmed by seeing all three ways, then just go and try to do the box method now and see if it works for you. And only come back to the video later if you're like, no, this isn't working. Um, I'll tell you the advantages to slide and divide. So if you wanted to at least see that to get an idea of whether you'd like it or not, then here is the advantages and disadvantages to slide and divide. Slide and divide has um, less writing. So it's got that going for it. Um, but the cons are that it requires you to remember to do something at the end that students are really bad at remembering. It's really easy to forget the last step and that makes it wrong. Also, there will be some teachers who do not like this method because um, it kind of feels like it's cheating in a way uh, because what we're doing is not actually like a mathematical thing we can do. So here we go. Slide and divide involves us sliding the first number over to the last number and saying, what if instead our question was x squared minus 7x plus 6? What would that factor into? And that's going to work like what we did at the beginning of the video, where we say x squared splits into x and x, and 6 splits into, let's see, 1 and 6, adds to get 7, but we want them to both be negative. Okay? Easy, right? That's what we did last week or whatever, whenever we did it. But here's the thing, we did slide, now we're going to divide. So we're going to divide both of these numbers in our parentheses by this number that we slid. The two that we moved over now needs to come back here and here. What we do is we simplify this fraction we just made uh, as much as we can, and if it doesn't simplify completely, then after we've simplified it, we move it in front of our x. So for instance, this is a negative one half that doesn't simplify. So we're going to rewrite it so that it has that two that's on bottom in front. This is two X minus one. And then negative six divided by two does simplify to negative three. So this parentheses is going to be X minus three. This goes, I think, a lot quicker than the box method does. You're actually still asking yourself the same question because it still involves multiplying the first and third terms together and saying what multiplies to get that and adds to get the middle, but just our work is different and quicker and shorter. It's that divide part though, like if you leave your answer as x minus one times x minus six, you are wrong, um, very wrong, because that does not multiply to get you two x squared minus seven x plus three. So if you're gonna do slide and divide, you have to remember that whatever you slide, you then also have to divide. All right, on B here. We want to do slide and divide. So I'm going to do 20 times negative 15, which is negative 300. So we're going to say x squared minus 13x minus 300. We're going to factor that. Now, if I make a long list of things that multiply to get negative 300, I'm going to go all the way to the end. I do recommend with a big number like 300 using a calculator to help you make this list, unless your teacher does not allow you to use a calculator at all and then you shouldn't use a calculator. But um, this is actually my third time trying to do this problem because I um, actually messed up on the factor that I needed 
And using a calculator probably would have been uh, the best way to avoid that because 12 times 25 gives us 300. And that's what subtracts to get 13. So um, this would be, I'm guessing, a really hard set of factors to come up with just uh, off the top of your head. It certainly was for me. If you have a big number, use, um, use your calculator to help you. So because we want negative 13, I'm gonna make the 25 negative because negative 25 plus 12 gives us negative 13. Now I want to divide by what I slid. So I'm gonna divide both of these by 20. Neither of them divide evenly, but they both simplify. So I do that. 25 over 20 simplifies by five. And uh, 12 divided by 20 simplifies by four. But since they didn't go in evenly, I move these numbers in front of x. So 4x minus 5 and 5x plus 3. And it's a great idea to just do some a little bit of at least the multiplication here to make sure you're right. It's actually how I figured out that I was doing it wrong the second time that I did it. So 4x and 3 together. That's not what I meant to do. So 4x and 5x together give us 20x squared. Uh, for it. And then I would do negative 5 times 3 to get negative 15. Since both of those work, I can be like pretty sure that I did it right because of uh, using this method. Because if you mess up on slide and divide, I think that's that's usually you mess up even, even those two things. Um, that may just sound weird, but that's our answer. 4x minus 5 and 5x plus 3. You can, by the way, switch these parentheses around. You just, you have to have the 4x and negative 5 together and the 5x plus 3 together. You can't like have 4x and plus 3 together and have it work. So that's slide and divide. If you like this method, you do not have to keep watching. But if you want to see the last method, um, then, you know, that that's the, that's the next example. This is called split the middle term because what we're gonna do is split this middle term. So I'm gonna rewrite five X squared and minus eight. I'm gonna come up here to the side and I'm still going to do the same first step of five times negative eight, which multiplies to get negative 40. I'm gonna come up with what multiplies to get negative 40 that adds to get negative 18. But the way I'm gonna write it this time is I'm gonna uh, split up the middle term into two things right here. Um, using the numbers that I get from negative 40 adding to get negative 18. I think 2 and 20 is what I need. 2 and 20 multiplies to get 40. I'm going to make the 20 be negative to get negative 20x and plus 2x. Now this looks like our factoring by grouping situation that we did last lesson, where we can say, hey, what do 5x squared and negative 20x have in common? They have a 5x, so we divide these both by 5x and get x minus 4. And what do these last two have in common? They're both divisible by 2, and then I get x minus 4. So then since they both have an x minus 4, I write down x minus 4, and then I write 5x plus 2, and voila. Here's my answer. I actually really enjoyed that, so I'm not sure why I don't use split the middle term. Um, I think it's because I can do a lot of slide and divide in my head, which means that it's the least amount of writing for me. Um, but yeah, it's whatever. All right, last one here. We're gonna do nine X squared, negative 10. We're gonna do nine times negative 10, which is negative 90. What multiplies get negative 90 and adds to get nine. My confidence is shaken because example 3B took me um, three shifts three tries. So, I don't know. Four doesn't go in. Five goes in 18 times. Six goes in 15 times. That's what we need. So, I want to add to get nine, and that means that I need a plus 15x and a minus 6x. It doesn't matter which order you put them in, by the way. So, you just pick an order and go for it. Uh, we're going to group these two and these two. So 9x squared and 5, 15x both have a 3x in common, which leaves us with 3x plus 5. Uh, then 
negative 6x minus 10 both have a 2 in common and also a negative in common. So we're going to do negative 2. And when we divide these both by negative 2, we get 3x plus 5. So they both have 3x plus 5. And then we write the 3x and the minus 2 in our other parentheses. So this is our answer. That was a lot of information if you watched all the way through. So just keep in mind, you don't need to do every single one of these methods. If you like guess and check though, I would try to use, I would try to learn one of the other three as a backup method because there's definitely times where guess and check is going to just feel impossible uh, based on the numbers we're given. So um, yeah, pick a method you like and go with it. I actually on my website have some uh, practice for this where it just gives you problems over and over again and has the correct answers. So it doesn't really um, like give you help. That's a functionality that I would like for it to eventually have. But right now um, it just gives you a problem and then lets you uh, check to see if what, what you're doing is right. So if you want to check that out, I'll put the link in the description for this like specific site that that's at. Thanks so much for watching. Please like the video, subscribe, leave me a comment if you'd like with your favorite quadratic trinomial. Um, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.